Well, very good. Well, welcome back. I know that was a quick break, but um, uh, we are very excited about our next speaker. So we'll go ahead and get our discussion rolling. Um, and thank you also again to Dr. Lee and to Aaron. I think both are hanging on. If you had questions, you can continue to send them through the chat to them. But we are going to now talk about supportive care during survivorship. And we are going to hear from Dr. Chase Bailey Dorton. And she is the Chief of Integrative Oncology and Assistant Professor of Medicine at Atrium Health Levine Cancer Institute in Charlotte. And Dr. Bailey Dorton currently sees patients in an integrative oncology consult clinic and oversees acupuncture, healing touch, massage, tai chi, yoga, nutrition classes, art, music therapy, pet therapy, mindfulness, and much, much more. So it is my pleasure to now turn it over to Dr. Bailey Dorton. So thank you guys for allowing me to come speak. You know, I've learned a lot already listening to everyone. Um, so it's my honor to be here and I appreciate the invite. So just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I am trained as a primary care physician. Uh, next slide. But I think a better qualification is I'm a cancer survivor. So nobody knows what it's like to ever hear those words. You know, you're kind of trucking along in life just fine, and all of a sudden you get thrown into this hurricane. Next slide. You know, most things in life, you feel bad, you go to the doctor, they do something to make you feel better. Sometimes with a cancer diagnosis, we might not feel bad, but we face treatments that make us feel worse. And the overwhelming question at the beginning is, what can I do? You know, how can I help myself? How can I get through this? How do I recover? Um, I often tell patients our goal is to load the boat with as much stuff as possible to help them, but we don't want to sink the boat. So we have to be careful with what we do to help them. Next slide. So what I want to talk a little bit about today is what is integrative oncology? Uh, what are the evidence-based guidelines for integrative oncology? You've heard that spoken about a little bit here this morning. How can this help during treatment? How can this help during treatment side effects? And how can it help during survivorship? After I went through my diagnosis, I ended up doing a fellowship in what's called integrative medicine at uh, University of Arizona with a Dr. Andrew Weil. And then about seven years ago, I came up to Charlotte to start the program here at the Levine Cancer Institute. Next slide. So by definition, integrative oncology is a patient-centered, evidence-informed, field of cancer care that's going to utilize mind and body practices, natural products, lifestyle, alongside of conventional care. This is not instead of conventional care. This is alongside of conventional care. This is not alternative medicine. My oncologists know what I do. I know what they do. We work together. And we really want to look at how do we optimize the health of this patient? How do we help their quality of life? How can we possibly improve clinical outcomes? And really, how do we empower that patient to be a part of that treatment, to give them things that they can do to help themselves. Next slide. And so the Society for Integrative Oncology, which is a um, multinational organization, and I'm um, blessed to be on the board of directors for, has the mission of how do we advance some evidence-based, comprehensive, integrative health care to improve the lives of people affected by cancer. And part of their mission is developing as many evidence-based guidelines as we can to safely incorporate some of these integrative strategies into conventional oncology clinical practice. Next slide. And a couple of years ago, the uh, American College of Chest Physicians uh, put out a guideline looking at complementary therapies in lung cancer with the goal of how do we improve the overall care of the lung cancer patients. And they had about 15 different recommendations. Next slide. They said that all lung cancer patients should be asked about their interests in and usage of complementary therapies, and then have a discussion about benefits and risk that we need to look at some mind-body modalities to help with anxiety, mood disturbance, sleep disturbance, and help improve quality of life. We also need to look at some of these modalities in terms of helping with um, acute or chronic pain. Next slide. Looking at some of these modalities for helping with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, that we need to look at yoga, which can help with fatigue or sleep disturbance. Uh, massage therapy that can help with anxiety or pain, 
um, acupuncture for nausea and vomiting. And really that's where acupuncture first kind of came in was helping with this nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy or radiation. But now that if you got some better meds, it kind of is not used as frequently for that. And also what can we do to help with any pain or peripheral neuropathy and acupuncture has been shown to help with that too. Next slide. So our goals for integrative oncology is how do we safely incorporate complementary therapies? How do we address the physical, the psychological, the social, and the spiritual aspects for our patients? How do we enhance that patient's sense of control? How do we optimize the healing process? How can we minimize side effects of treatment? How can we maximize recovery? And then, is there anything we can do to make a person healthier at the end of treatment or decrease risk of recurrences? Next slide. So in our in integrative oncology clinic, we will often see patients when they're first diagnosed, which is actually best because then we can help them get through this very early on. We get patients seen for treatment side effect management. Also at the end of treatment to help somebody. We look at overall risk reductions. Uh, we help with any supplement questions. And then we go through, um, you know, nutrition, physical activity, sleep, supplements, sexual health, stress management, environmental health, and refer for integrative modalities. We often um, think that we're probably the only group that really ask about sexual health, which is part of, of quality of life for a lot of our folks. Next slide. So why has integrative oncology emerged? There are a couple studies that show that about 60 to 90% of patients are using some type of therapy or supplement but they're not telling their oncologist. And so we want to be a reliable source of info and we want to be able to advise them about using this. And also, like I said, it's that when you get that diagnosis of cancer, it's the sense of disem disempowerment and inability to partner with care. So we're kind of coming along to help bridge that. Next slide. And the fact of the matter, I tell patients all the time, there's so much misinformation on the internet. There's always somebody trying to sell us something. Suddenly, all our family and friends are telling us what we should do or shouldn't do. So it's our job to help them kind of get through that maze safely. Next slide. So one of the key things we deal with with patients is supplements. Um, and there's just a great potential for drug, supplement, and herb interactions. You know, we just don't have studies. Or it's not practical or feasible or it's not the financial background to do a, a study on every single drug every single herb or everything out there. So we want to try and make as much evidence informed decisions as possible. And an easy way to explain this, many of you have heard about, you know, certain blood pressure medicines that you don't take with grapefruit juice. It's kind of the same philosophy. We don't want a patient taking anything that might make their treatment more toxic or make it less effective. And as you've heard Dr. Lee mention, some of our therapies are getting so much better with better outcomes. We don't want to do anything to interfere with that. Next slide. I always tell folks about this. This is a great free app that you can get on your phone or your computer. It's put out by Memorial Sloan Cancer, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. It's called About Herbs. And it has almost every herb supplement or a complementary therapy in there that you can search. It will give you a great handout about what the current research is, what the risk, what the potential interactions are. It's just a great uh, app and resource for everybody to have. I always make sure all my um, oncology fellows when they rotate through or students have this. So this is something you can get download for free and encourage everybody to have that. Next slide. So what can we do from the integrative uh, standpoint during treatment? Next slide. So an integrative treatment plan for us when we deal with a patient, um, I guess I'm getting a little bit redundant here, but I think it's important to avoid a lot of supplements during chemo. We're very conservative during chemo. We'll often check labs to see if there's something we can replace that's needed with a supplement. We talk a lot about gut health. You know, what are the pros or cons of adding a probiotic? What are the risks? What are the different brands you should try? Because these are not well regulated over the market. So we want to make sure somebody's doing a quality product. We talk about sleep. You know, how can we help somebody sleep that doesn't involve another medication? whether that be yoga, acupuncture, physical activity, something called cognitive behavioral th training. You know, and I haven't met a survivor yet that didn't have trouble sleeping at some point in time. So how can we get them sleeping, which is going to help how they feel overall um, and really affect their quality of life? 
we look at hydration and we look at taste changes. We look at weight changes. How can we help somebody maintain weight with a healthy diet? We talk about nausea. You know, some, some studies show that maybe a ginger tea or ginger chew could help. I mentioned earlier that acupuncture can help with nausea. How do we get somebody uh, being physically active during treatment? You know, cancer fatigue is a real problem. And there's some interesting research about the more physically active we can keep you, the less that fatigue will be. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but it is something that we try to help our patients keep active. We talk about nutrition. Um, and then we talk about stress management. I'm going to go into that a little bit more detail here in a minute. Next slide. Being diagnosed with cancer and undergoing treatment is stressful. You know, I always kind of chuckle when we have some of these distress screenings where we ask our patients about depression, anxiety, worry, sleep, and decreased physical function. And then if they have our abnormality, we say they need treatment. But my point of view is if you didn't have some of this at diagnosis, there might be something more wrong with you. So how do we help you process through some of these emotions? And how do we help you deal with some of these side effects? Next slide. So some of the treatment side effects we want to help our patients with is, you know, we mentioned the GI issues, the fatigue, neuropathy, not as much as some of the newer treatments, but still an issue. Some of this memory issue or chemo brain, some of these uh, mood issues, problems with weight loss, pain, um, sleep issues. And also, as Dr. Lee mentioned, some of the itises, and whether it's gastritis, dermatitis, you know, how do we help with some of these itises that come along with some of the treatments? Next slide. So yoga, there's some pretty interesting research that yoga can help with this chemo brain um, that people talk about. It's been shown to help with anxiety. It's been shown to help with pain and it's been shown to help with sleep. Uh, I'm real proud of my program. We've been able to um, pivot here with a lot of virtual classes that we're able to offer our patients for yoga. And the thing is, you want to make sure you're in the right type of yoga class because, you know, if you've had surgery or if some patients have a port, it's got to be a proper restorative type yoga, not something where they're trying to binge into a pretzel. Next slide. So fatigue. So one of the first approaches we take with patients when they come in with fatigue is making sure some, you know, basic lab work's been checked, whether that's a B12 or the anemic or anything else that we need to look at. You know, what's their physical activity like? Are they potentially on a medication that has a side effect that's making that fatigue worse? Um, you know, can we get them in a gentle yoga class to help? What about stress? Is there, you know, I've had patients that have just so many multiple stressors going on that we need to kind of help them process through that. And, and I tell patients, we're never going to get away with stress in our life, but we've got to do something to turn that stress response off to kind of help deal with that stressor. This is a picture of Tai Chi, which is actually a wonderful uh, modality for a lot of our lung patients is kind of a slow meditative movement uh, that can help with breathing. Um, it's also some studies helping with um, osteoarthritis in patients. And then once again, for fatigue, if someone's not sleeping, then we know they're fatigued. So let's back up, help them with the sleep, and then see if some of the fatigue improves. Next slide. It says, that's odd. My neck suddenly feels better. This is a picture of early acupuncture. Um, I like to say that we have improved tremendously with our techniques for this. We actually have group acupuncture here at LCI, so it brings the cost down and uh, makes it a little bit more affordable and easier access for our patients. Next slide. You've heard mentioned a little bit earlier about these NCCN guidelines, which are the National Comprehensive Cancer Network's guidelines for evidence-based treatment, and about five of the 11 supportive guidelines include the use of acupuncture. Uh, there was a study, too, published about patients who had had a prior thoracotomy that acupuncture could help with the pain in that, that surgical site. Next slide. So insomnia. Like I said, I haven't met a survivor yet that didn't deal with insomnia at some point in time. You know, we get in and really look at their nutrition. Is there anything we can help with that? Are they moving? Are they something we can help them with the stress? Can we incorporate some yoga? How about some massage? How about some mindfulness-based uh, relaxation. Also, in terms of massage, if you're going to someone, you want to make sure that they're trained in oncology massage, um, that they know how to deal with any possible neuropathy or impossible surgical sites or any possible tumor sites. Next slide. 
So one quarter of what you eat keeps you alive. The other three quarters keeps your doctor alive. As doctors, we didn't get a lot of uh, education on nutrition, and we know that nutrition is important for our patients. If you look, it seems like a different nutrition guideline comes out every day. Um, we don't believe that nutrition in, in either extreme of the spectrum is good. So how can we get you with some highly nutritious, quality food? Um, and I always tell patients, not a perfect diet. We don't, we can't expect a perfect diet, but we got to be able to help you get through some of the misinformation that's out there. Next slide. So, but it's complicated. So let's look at this. If you look at this picture here up in the left corner, it says zero added sugar. Okay. Well, that's probably good. Then it says zero artificial sweeteners. Okay. Well, that, that's probably good. 0% fat, um, 15 grams of protein. Well, you know, you told you probably need to have protein in your diet. You look at the upper right corner, it says vitamin D. Okay, well, I've heard something about vitamin D. So this strawberry yogurt is probably good for me. But if you go down and look at the ingredient list, read through it. So there's non-fat milk, chicory root, water, uh, juice concentrate, natural flavors, stevia, leaf extract, sodium citrate, sea salt. What's the one thing that's not listed on the ingredient list of the strawberry yogurt? Strawberries. So it's complicated to look at some of the labels out there. And we've been able to do some classes to really help people figure out how to read some of these labels and how to pick out what is truly a healthy product, healthy food product. And I always laugh and say, if this little redneck girl can change your diet to healthy, anybody can. So we wanna help people make some of those healthy decisions. Next slide. This is another resource that I really like. It's called The Cancer Fighting Kitchen by Rebecca Katz. It's got great recipes. She's got some great tips in here on how to deal with any taste changes. She's got um, what's called the magic mineral broth, which is this really nutrient dense uh, broth that people can take when they're not really feeling like eating. How can we have, keep some nutrients in them, maybe keep some fluids in them? But it's a great resource. She has a couple other books. Um, if I can make the recipes out of here, anybody can. So it's pretty uh, amendable for those of us who don't have a lot of cooking skills. Next slide. So let's talk about, you know, things are not the same once we've heard that word. You know, things never kind of go back the same. So how do we deal with this new life that we're in after a cancer diagnosis? Next slide. You know, sometimes it feels like this when you're transitioning to survivorship or, or going through this. Um, I often tell folks that sometimes the end of treatment is even worse than the beginning the diagnosis, um, going through the thoughts of, I didn't know I had this. Is it going to come back? Will I know? Can I do anything to keep it from coming back? Next slide. I, I really like these statements, you know, cancer may leave the body, but it never leaves our life. Um, cancer is not one event, it's a journey. And that journey does not end when treatment ends. You know, I've had a lot of folks who have kind of gotten to the end of treatment and they tell me when I go back and my family and friends are what's wrong with you treatment's over why aren't you why are you still having these problems but you know, it takes a while for us to kind of get through some of this stuff we may look like we're okay but we're still dealing with a lot of this next slide so this is another resource for you this is called mindfulness-based cancer recovery how do we take this approach to help us cope with maybe long-term treatment how do we kind of get back to life? How do we deal with the uncertainty of survivorship? This is written by Linda Carlson. She's actually the incoming president for the Society of Integrative Oncology. So it's another great resource um, to really help us kind of moving forward. Next slide. So how do we continue to bring quality to these lives we have have fought so hard to keep? I often tell my patients that my ultimate goal is for them to become stronger for having been through this. You know, how you, you realize what's important in life, what's not important in life. You find that there are some friends you thought would be there for you, but they back away. There are other people you didn't even really think knew your name, but they come out of the woodwork to be there for you. So how do we become stronger emotionally, spiritually? How do we whether we're cured or not, we want to be healed. How do we get to that point for having gone through this? I always say that uh, 
I told somebody when I was diagnosed that cancer survivors are a great group of people. Initiations help, but we're a great group of people. Next slide. So, you know, fighting cancer can be overwhelming. It can be scary and confusing. There are these complex physical, emotional, social issues during and after treatment. Well, we always have that worry about recurrence or progression. You know, we're dealing with some of these side effects. Next slide. And for a lot of folks, you know, cancer has become chronic treatment. You know, most folks are going to be on treatment for a long time. And it not only affects them, but this is something for the whole family. Everybody's affected by this. I describe cancer sometimes as this big white elephant. Um, you know, when you're first diagnosed, the elephant takes up the whole room and is sitting on you. You know, I'm 17 years out. The elephant's still there, but it might be small in the corner, but there might be things that want to make the elephant grow. So how do I learn to control that elephant in my life? Next slide. So there's often this transition point with survivorship. And I tell folks that this recovery is a process. It's not a date on the calendar. And that this recovery can often take longer than the actual treatment. Uh, we've seen some great um, slides today from Dr. Lee about how the survival rates are improving, but the recovery can be just as long too. Sometimes patients have described it um, as going from a fight mode to I hope it doesn't come back mode. Next slide. I always say there's a law of cancer that for every physical effect, there's an equal reactive psychological effect. Next slide. And this, like I said, I think some anxiety and depression and some of these feelings are normal. Now, we don't want to get stuck in these emotions, but I think they're, it's okay to have these emotions and process through them. You know, we feel like we've had that loss of control. There's some self-esteem issues. You know, some lung cancer patients still face this stigma about that diagnosis. There's dealing with this uncertainty and vulnerability that we have um, that, you know, we need folks to help us process through these emotions. I think that's part of the adaption of it, of this process. Next slide. And I think too, for all patients and for lung patients, there's, um, you know, breathing. We're talking about, you know, breathing is that one system that we have that's performed consciously and unconsciously. It's a completely voluntary act or it's an involuntary act. It's a balance really between our uh, autonomic nervous system. And, and some have described it as a breath. This is this bridge between these two systems. You know, I've read, I've read some stuff where they say our life begins on an in-breath when we're born and it ends on an out-breath when we die. And breathing is a very, um, it comes a critical point for some of our lung patients. Um, either they're having shortness of breath, they're not trusting their breathing. Um, so it's something we kind of help them process through. And there's a lot of a, a emotional component to it too. This is an example of um, a breathing techniques and how to really work on those breathings and how it's tied to, you know, tied to stress. So if you're in a stressful situation, you have a very shallow breathing, you kind of hold your breath and it kind of really kickstarts the whole stress response anyway. So I think breath work is something important to really work on. So stress, it says, and you think you have stress. I love this picture. Um, so this little dog's probably as stressed as we are most of the time. Next slide. And I always say I didn't survive cancer to die from stress. Um, you know, nowadays when I see a new patient, when I get to the stress, the question is, other than this cancer diagnosis and a pandemic, any other stressors going on for you? Um, and that certainly has added another level for us all. Next slide. So possible cancer stressors. Facing the possibility of death, chemotherapy, cancer surgery and its recovery, family and friends pulling away, inability to fulfill past work, family or other roles, returning to quote normal, the possibility of recurrence or I'd say or progression, how your family will cope with the possibility of your absence. Next slide. Don't deny the diagnosis, justify the verdict that is supposed to go with it. That's by Norman Cousins. Next slide. What cancer cannot do. Cancer is so limited. It cannot cripple love. It cannot shatter hope. It cannot corrode faith. It cannot destroy peace. It cannot kill friendship. It cannot suppress memories. It cannot silence courage. 
it cannot invade the soul. It cannot conquer the spirit. Next slide. So I said, there are positive effects. I always want somebody to become stronger. You know, a lot of our patients say they've strengthened their relationships after going through this. They have this renewed sense of gratitude for big things and small things. They do have a sense of empowerment and an increased appreciation for life. Next slide. So this is my team. Um, I have Rebecca Greiner, who's um, a PA who sees patients in follow-up, and Dr. Hari Haran, my new partner that sees patients different sites. Next slide. This is where we are in LCI and seeing patients throughout the state and in South Carolina. And I can say one of the good things that's come out of this pandemic is we are now able to do virtual consults for patients. So I've got patients all throughout South Carolina now and a part of North Carolina where we can do a consult. You don't have to drive to Charlotte. Next slide. I also want to give a shout out to the Wind River folks. Um, they've put on some great retreats for survivors. They are certainly involved with this organization. Um, Cheryl does a great job working with patients. So I put a shout out to anybody that has not been to one of the retreats. You not need to get on board and try to go to one of their retreats. Next slide. So that's the end. So let's open it to questions. Awesome. Dr. Bailey Dorton, thank you so much. I loved your pictures throughout, um, really engaging and just fun. And, and it's exciting too, with all of these research updates, um, lung cancer is becoming more of a chronic disease and people are surviving mm -hmm. and figuring out how we live with it. Um, all of the resources that you guys provide at Atrium Health are so important. So um, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Bailey Dorton, I encourage you to put them in the chat. I have a couple of questions personally that I thought of um, as you were talking. I'm curious, um, is the, the world of integrative oncology support, is this new in terms of the healthcare cancer center setting? And do you ever receive hesitancy from um, patients that might not want that support, but you know could benefit from that support? And how do you navigate that? Um, it's growing. So if you look at some of your major cancer centers, they now have integrative oncology programs. MD Anderson has a big program. Memorial Sloan Kettering has a big program. UCLA, we have, we have one of the blessed to have one of the biggest programs too. Um, actually the hesitancy sometimes comes from the oncologists initially uh, until they realize what we're doing. Um, I think one of the biggest complaints we get from patients is I wish I'd known about you sooner. Yeah, you know, we're, we're often the, the best kept secret around. Um, I've been blessed to be with LCI since the very beginning. So my oncologist, well, she's been here the whole time. We're not sure what she does, but she's here the whole time. And <laughs> patients really like what she does. So we'll send patients over there. So I think part of it is, I think the hardest patients for us to see in integrative oncology are patients who don't want to do conventional care. They only want to do alternative care. Um, because there's so much misinformation out there. And, and I tell them all the time, there's nothing we know of in the alternative world to help with cancer, the same thing we're getting with conventional care, but we can certainly help you get through the conventional care. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and we just had a, a question come in. How does integrative oncology interact with patients at end of life? Yeah, so we are there with patients helping them kind of process that. We don't do some of the... Um, hospice work or some of the palliative work that our colleagues do, but we work closely with them. Um, so we're there for the end of life stuff. We're also there for long-term survivorship too. I always tell patients we're supposed to be a consult, but we can't let go of you. We stay with you forever. Once you have that consult, you never let them go. Exactly. <laughs> um, another question, does insurance generally cover the cost of integrative medicine in particular Medicare? Yeah. So I'm covered under regular insurance, our office visits, for our integrative modalities, we are heavily uh, blessed with a lot of philanthropy. So like our acupuncture is done in a group setting. So I think the cost is um, 60 for the first visit, 40 for each treatment after. Healing touch is fully supported by philanthropy. Massage is like, I think it's 40 or $60 for an hour. And our classes, everything else is supported by philanthropy. You know, we, we're starting to get heavily involved in research to try to show insurance companies that, hey, these are services that can maybe decrease costs and they really need to be covered under some of your insurance plans. Right. That was going to be my follow-up question of, is mm. there any kind of like advocacy or research happening to kind of change that and get more insurance coverage? So 
that's great to hear that all of that is kind of in motion. Um, all right, well, I think those are all of the questions that we had. So thanks again, Dr. Bailey Dorton, for your time and being here. Um, it's really exciting to hear what you guys are doing at Levine. And any survivors on the call, I think Jenny sent a link to the, um, our lung cancer wellness retreat that we host through Wind River. So we're really excited. That's a um, program that we do every year trying to provide supportive care to lung cancer patients in our